Good afternoon. My name is Doug Cox, and on behalf of the DC Lawyers Chapter, welcome to our July luncheon. This is our traditional Supreme Court roundup, but this year, circumstances permit us to modify tradition a little bit. In recent years, as the Supreme Court has served up flawed decision after flawed decision, the roundup has been a festival of bitterness, a carnival of regret, and a feast of disappointment. This year, things are looking up, particularly compared to where we were at last year's roundup. Last year, we were contemplating the impending Hillary Clinton presidency, with all that would mean for the courts and the rule of law. This year, we are frolicking in the sunshine of the Trump presidency. <laughs> The colors, the colors are brighter, the air is fresher, and even the food tastes better. Instead of the fighting, mudslinging, and ugliness of the inevitable second Clinton impeachment, now civility and decorum reign. <laughs> Last year, the society had to assume it would be an eclipse during the Clinton administration reduced to fighting a rearguard action as our leadership was led off to re-education camps. <laughs> this year, the society is riding high and widely praised for its role in the legal culture. In fact, at a recent Senate confirma confirmation hearing, all four candidates, two judicial nominees and two executive branch nominees, were members of the society. Last year, we were assuming that the nomination of Merrick Garland or if someone further left, would lock the Supreme Court into a nihilistic death spiral. <laughs> this year, with the confirmation of Justice Gorsuch, the court has the opportunity to pull itself into a death ellipsis, <laughs> kind of like a death spiral, but somewhat less obviously fatal. <laughs> Although we continue to feel the loss of Justice Scalia, we can savor the clarity and rigor of Justice Gorsuch's first opinions. The New York Times, of course, does not see Justice Gorsuch that way. A recent op-ed about the new justice was headlined, Trump's life-tenured judicial avatar. Now, that certainly sounds exciting. <laughs> Had Justice Gorsuch body slammed one of his colleagues? Had he labeled another justice's opinion fake law? <laughs> or even commented on Justice Kennedy's failure to retire by tweeting, tweeting the one word, sad? <laughs> Unfortunately, the Times headline promised far more than it delivered. What caught the writer's attention was simply that Justice Gorsuch turned out to be as serious about text, the legislative process, and judicial interpretation as he had stated he was going to be during the confirmation process. As the writer observed, quote, no real surprise there and no real news either. And we all know what the opposite of real news is. The writer did find newsworthy what was described as, quote, the sheer flamboyance of the new justice's opinions, suggesting that someone does not know what flamboyance means. <laughs> we are, after all, talking about judicial opinions, not party hats. And even though this year, Justice Kennedy somehow concluded that the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life did not compel his retirement, there's always next year. <laughs> this year, once again, we're excited to have as our guide to the Supreme Court, Miguel Estrada, a partner with Gibson, Dunn and & Crutcher, and an experienced Supreme Court advocate, fresh from his audition to play the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> we always like to have a little fun with numbers at these events. Many commentators, of course, have known the term, set a modern record for consensus. But the number we are 
most interested in today is Miguel's running one loss record in the Supreme Court. As we all know, because we all keep track of this, counting his tenure in the Solicitor General's office, Miguel has now argued a total of 23 cases before the court. In private practice at Gibson, Miguel has had nine Supreme Court arguments and won seven of them. His two losses came in cases involving criminals, both pro bono cases, so no billable hours were lost. <laughs> Putting aside the criminals, Miguel's win rate in cases for more typical clients remains a remarkable 100%. Not so much a one-loss ratio as just winning. So much winning. <laughs> <laughs> and we are still not tired of it. <laughs> One of the things that contributes to Miguel's success is his ability to turn a phrase, whether in argument or outside the courtroom, as he demonstrated earlier this year. Miguel, we recall, was nominated by President George W. Bush in 2001 for a seat on the D.C. Circuit, but his nomination was filibustered by Senate Democrats led by Senator Schumer. This spring, in response to rumors that he might be President Trump's nominee for Solicitor General, another Senate-confirmed position, Miguel issued a statement. I was immensely lucky to have the chance to serve our country years ago, but it did not work out. I have only respect and best wishes for those who agree to serve despite the deterioration of the confirmation process over the years. But everyone who knows me in town knows that I would never accept a job that requires Senate confirmation, or for that matter, willingly place myself in any situation in which convention requires that I be civil to Chuck Schumer. <laughs> Unusually direct and forceful, some might even call it Trumpian. <laughs> now, Senator Schumer himself is a clever man with a phrase. In filibustering Miguel's nomination to the D.C. Circuit, he dramatically argued that Miguel was, quote, a stealth missile with a nose cone coming out of the right wing's deepest silo. Now, it's hard to know precisely what that metaphor means. <laughs> Would Senator Schumer have supported Miguel if he somehow lacked a metaphorical nose cone? <laughs> Does the deep silo reference reflect the senator's unspoken fear that Miguel was a bad hombre who had tunneled <laughs> under the border? <laughs> Although Miguel's judicial nomination did not work out, it does turn out, in retrospect, to have been a key step in the cascading series of events that led the Senate to change the rules for Supreme Court nominations, permitting nominees to be confirmed by majority vote with no possibility of filibuster. So in a very real sense, Justice Gorsuch owes his confirmation to Miguel. <laughs> Miguel's reputation as an advocate continues to shine. Washingtonian Magazine described him as one of the true rising stars of the legal profession. In 2014, the American lawyer named him Litigator of the Year, praising his brains and tenacity and describing him as the lawyer to call for a tough, potentially unwinnable case. Miguel was also selected for inclusion in the 2015 edition of the Best Lawyers in America in numerous specialties, including appellate law, commercial litigation, and criminal defense. From 2015 through 2017, he was among the Law Dragon 500 leading lawyers in America, Chambers has named him as one of a handful of attorneys that are ranked in the top tier among the nation's appellate lawyers. He graduated from Harvard Law School and clerked for Justice Kennedy. He is a trustee of the, <laughs> he is a trustee of the Supreme Court Historical Society and has served as a member of the Board of Visitors of the Harvard Law School. Miguel was on the short list of potential Supreme Court nominees issued last fall by Gary Johnson the libertarian candidate for president. So if election 2016 had turned out even weirder, <laughs> Miguel's inclusion on the list was little noted at the time because, of course, Gary Johnson was little noted at the time. 
The Atlantic described one of Miguel's recent Supreme Court arguments as one of the most dazzling arguments the Marble Chamber has heard in many years. And we're delighted he's here to dazzle us today. Miguel. Oh, wow. After that uh, fulsome, and I do know what the word means, uh, introduction, um, and to quote uh, an actually famous Republican, I feel four feet tall. Um, thank you, Doug, uh, for that very generous introduction, and thank you all for having the patience to listen uh, to me uh, once again uh, in a very hot summer uh, during a very, very, very boring term Well, uh, when the court was just treading water. Um, waiting for a ninth and um, uh, hearing only extremely boring cases. Um, uh, thankfully uh, for you, I am going to make up for the extremely boring nature of the cases by, taking, uh, by talking about them for a long time. Um, <laughs> since uh, I was last year, we have a new uh, commander in chief um, and a new executive branch, or mostly we would have a new executive branch if there were nominations and appointments, um, but it's hard to find uh, nominees. You know, it's hard with the late nights. You have to work hard. You have to be clear by the Senate. You have to meet Chuck Schumer. Um, <laughs> and the Trump administration is especially hard because you only get one scoop of ice cream. Um, <laughs> uh, we were here, as uh, Doug mentioned, uh, to mourn last year the passing of a titan of the law, Justice Scalia, we still miss him. Uh, in reading some of this court's opinions, some of which were doozies, um, one just wonders what Justice Scalia would have said, and one really misses what he would have written. Um, and uh, we miss him still. For those of you who have, who have not yet seen the Society's documentary on the justice, it is excellent and touching, and I commend it to you most warmly. Um, so, against all conventional wisdom, the Republican uh, strategy of holding um, the seat open and waiting for the election of Donald J. Trump as President of the United States paid off. I myself was extremely skeptical. I have to say that I was on record as saying that uh, um, this was somewhat unlikely and that we should take Mary Garland last summer rather than Nina Pillar this spring. Um, I am rarely wrong, but when I am... <laughs> But when I am wrong, I do admit it, usually very quietly and only to myself, but I, but I, but I, but I do admit it. Um, but, you know, we have Justice Gorsuch, and, uh, you know, uh, the Democrats put up a real fight, a dumb fight, but a real fight. Um, they uh, put up a filibuster. They had to uh, invoke the nuclear uh, option, and he got confirmed by a 54 to 45 vote. Um, he had only the April sitting of the court. Um, all signs are excellent. His opinions are crisp, lucid. Um, and every sign, as Doug pointed out, is that he's going to annoy the bejesus out of the New York Times, which uh, <laughs> makes us all very happy. Um, as all of you who have been here more than once and who have been here in the halcyon days where Ted Olson used to do these things much, much better than I, um, we have a tradition of starting these events with a prize for the individual who exemplifies egregious hypocrisy, crest dealing, and dishonorable behavior. Um, you know, this is open to the entire country, but hey, this is Washington, and so, you know, the pickings ain't slim. Um, and so, once again, you know, we have an embarrassment of riches, if you can call them that, um, and, uh, you know, out of a sense of impartiality, of course, I have to consider the new president of the United States, uh, who in the very short span of his administration has managed to upend any sense of normalcy of sanity um, uh, that we are usually accustomed to. You know, the alternative facts, the crowds, the kofifi, the tweets, the mica, the, pl the, the plastic surgery. Uh, there's a lot um, that would make him um, a good candidate for this award. Um, but hey, I did just mention Justice Gorsuch, right? Um, and sort of somehow he did manage to stumble into an excellent cabinet, a member of which is seated here with us. Um, and a lot of things are going very, very well when he's not tweeting. Um, and finally, one of the most important lessons that I have learned in, in many years of marriage is that you should never shoot inside the foxhole. Uh, <laughs> 
at least not in public. Um, and so sticking to the other side of the aisle, um, we can look at the leading candidates. Of course, we have Hillary Clinton, um, who perhaps may be a candidate for the Lifetime Achievement Award in this category. Um, she managed to lose an election uh, she could not possibly lose, and then she has managed not to know how to shut up about it. Um, she ran as a, you know, the woman of the people who does not know how to run a subway turnstile. Um, and uh, she also managed the woman of the people to call half of the country deplorable. Um, you, know, you know, there is no rule against repeats, but we should try to keep our material fresh. Um, so after you know, a long and arduous consideration, we've decided to give this year's award to the inimitable and aptly named Anthony Weiner. <laughs> um, Anthony Weiner, for those who have been living under a rock, good for you, um, is a former no-neck congressman from New York City um, who um, first had to give up his congressional seat after a sexting sexcapade. Um, then was running for mayor of New York uh, and uh, had to give up that one uh, ignominiously because he was again sexting under the very original name of Carlos Danger, um, <laughs> a very dangerous hombre apparently. <laughs> and uh, finally, on the eve of the most contentious election in recent memory, he managed to upend yet another election, this time not his own, um, by having a mother load of Hillary's missing emails show up in his computer. And so to him goes the award this year. Um, I don't think they're gonna let him keep the trophy in prison, but luckily I think he's gonna make a whole raft of new friends who like him very much. Um, turning um, to the term statistics, um, as, I, as I said, uh, it was sort of dull. We had sort of a 69 cases in total including seven summary reversals. Uh, 41 were unanimous, you can hear the Z's already. Um, seven cases only were decided by one vote. Um, the, if you're looking about how the circuits did, you know, the sample sizes were pretty small, but in generally the, just, you know, the circuits that you expect to do poorly based on historical practices did poorly, the ninth, the sixth, and the federal circuit. Um, let's take a stab at the federal circuit so that we can get the really painful stuff out of the way first. Um, uh, you know, the court had uh, seven cases out of the federal circuit, uh, six patent cases and one First Amendment cases. In each of the six patent cases, the federal circuit was overturned. It was affirmed in the First Amendment case. Um, you know, the patent stuff is really, really hard and really complicated. Um, perhaps Congress should give some consideration to coming up with a specialized court for it. Um, <laughs> But in any event, um, most of them are so painfully complicated and that some of the statutes involved, uh, Congress could not bring itself to even give acronyms to them. Um, they involve things like biosimilar this and biosimilar that. If I told you about them, especially given that the outcomes were like, you know, really nothings, blood would start shooting out of your eyeballs and you would start wishing for Hillary Clinton presidency, and we don't want that. So I'll just pick one um, of them to sort of, um, so that you can um, sort of say that you've heard about the patent cases, and that will be the patent venue case, uh, T.C. Hartland versus Kraft, um, which if nothing else is not exactly interesting, but it is a good example of the endless cupidity of plaintiff's lawyers. Um, and so to set the stage, um, there is a venue provision in the, uh, in the patent laws that basically makes defendants suable where the uh, defendant resides. There is, of course, also a general venue statute that applies to all cases um, where uh, you are generally suable uh, in cases where you are amenable to personal jurisdictions. Now, of course, um, there is also this 1957 nugget from the Supreme Court, a case I won't bore you with, um, that basically says that a defendant generally resides only in its states of incorporation. So it basically means that companies could be sued for patent violations only in the states where they were incorporated. There were other minor 
provisions of the patent venue statute, not at issue here, but those were the main outlines of the fight. Um, you will not be shocked to learn that plaintiff's lawyers started figuring out how to apply the general venue statute to patent cases, and after some changes in the general venue statute, they finally convinced the Federal Circuit in 1990 that they could um, use the general venue statute to sue in patent cases. Not surprisingly, this led to the development of so-called patent districts, where just a handful of districts in the country got all of the uh, patent cases. And these were the districts um, where, um, shall we say, the plaintiff's lawyers believed that the bench and uh, the juries understood them. Um, and so um, one of the leading examples is the Eastern District of Texas, which accounts for about 38% of the filings in patent cases. Um, now, the metropolis at the center of this um, really important uh, hub of our economy is Marshall, Texas, a booming um, skyscraper-filled town of 25,000, uh, just on the edge of the Louisiana border. Um, it really has an economy that is heavily dependent on patent litigation. Um, <laughs> And uh, if you happen to, to visit, unlucky you, um, you will find that somehow there is an ice skating rink um, sponsored uh, by Samsung Corporation just across from the courthouse. Um, I don't know, this may be complete coincidence, but it may be that there is just a lot of native skating uh, talent in rural Texas. In any event, um, in a very ten, uh, short 10-page opinion, uh, the unanimous Supreme Court um, decided to put a pillow over the face of Marshall, Texas, um, <laughs> and uh, perhaps look for skating talent elsewhere, um, and um, concluded that the patent venue statute is indeed exclusive. Of course, you know, never say never. There are other parts of the venue statute. If you uh, read the recent legal uh, periodicals, you may have uh, read that uh, plaintiff's lawyers are already trying to sell the local judges in the Eastern District of Texas, that maybe this is not you know, the end of the road and that there may be future skating seasons in the offing. And so to moving um, uh, into something slightly more uh, interesting and certainly a lot more important, um, we, have, uh, we had a number of Bivens cases. And so for those of you who are not deeply steeped in Bivens, Bivens is the El Dorado of the left. It's basically the ability to sue um, government officials, uh, primarily cops and Republican political appointees, um, for uh, violations of the Constitution in the absence of any statute. Now, if you went to a school other than Yale Law School, you learned that this all comes from a 1971 case um, called Bivens versus Federal Agents of some drug bureau um, who busted into somebody's house. And in that case, the court 6-3 held that there was a cause of action based on the Fourth Amendment itself to sue the federal agents for damages. Now, you know, the court was cognizant of the fact that the Congress had provided a cause of action only against state agents in similar circumstances, Section 1983, but then sort of said, well, this is too important. We're going to allow you to sue on the basis of the Constitution itself. Um, and in the absence of Congress not doing anything affirmatively to tell us not to do it, or special factors cautioning, uh, cautioning us not to do this, or warranting hesitation, as the court put it. So that was 1971, and the 70s you know, was not a very good decade. Um, there was bad hair and bell bottoms, and uh, um, there was also two more Bivens cases, Carlson versus Green in 1980, basically saying that if you suffer from abuse in jail, you had a cause of action under the Eighth Amendment, and Davis versus Passman in 1979, um, saying that if um, you were sexually discriminated against, you had a cause of action under the Fifth Amendment. So you have three cases in the grand total history of the country saying that you can sue under the Constitution, the Fourth Amendment, Bivens, Davis versus Passman, the Fifth Amendment, and Carlson versus Green, the Eighth Amendment. Aha, uh -huh. uh, so therefore, you know, the gates are open, and we spend the next 40 years trying every conceivable amendment and clause of the Constitution to see if we could sue under it. And the Supreme Court gets wise to this, and for the next 40 years, Nyet, 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 nyet. That was before, you know, Putin came around and really was running our government, but <laughs> never mind. Um, 
Uh, and so uh, everything that was tried, the First Amendment, uh, procedural due process, social security benefits, suing private prisons, you name it, you know, the court said no, and every time it kept moving along and moving along and moving along, saying um, we have found that this is really better left for Congress. So now we come to this term, um, and we have a spate of Bivens cases uh, where the fight seems to be back in the court, and you know, the court sometimes, you never know what they're gonna do. Uh, and there is one in particular coming out of the Second Circuit called Sigler versus Abbasi. Um, Sigler versus Abbasi is a case in which the Second Circuit, to everybody's consternation, had found, in fact, that there was a Bivens cause of action um, for individuals who were illegal aliens from Muslim countries who had been rounded up after 9-11 and who claimed that they had been uh, rounded up on a discriminatory basis and been subject to abuse uh, while in the prisons in New York as a result of the unlawful actions by Attorney General Ashcroft, FBI Director Mueller, other federal officials, and the prison warden, a fellow by the name of Hasty. Um, for those of you to whom this sounds vaguely familiar is because this, uh, you know, the Supreme Court had heard this case before, um, sort of a companion to this case in 2009 um, in a case called Iqbal. And in that case, you know, the court took the same allegations, uh, well, mostly the same allegations, and concluded that the plaintiffs have failed to plead a case under Rule 8 and that a motion to dismiss should be granted. Um, for that case, the court assumed that there was a Bivens case because it concluded that even if there was a cause of action, these people had not pleaded a case and therefore they could be dismissed. So the cases go back to New York and these people, uh, at allegations which on the one side you would think don't change much because they have to do with the use of multiple lists, but on the other hand also could conceivably add a fair amount because they involve allegations of actual beatings and abuse in jail, um, which get you closer to what was at issue in Carlson versus Green, which was actual jail abuse. Um, and they also add what a novel thought, an actual claim under an actual statute, Section 1985, saying that all of these officials engage into a conspiracy um, with each other because they met in meetings, in cabinet meetings, and they engage in approving prisoner transfers without engaging in individualized determinations. So this goes to the Second Circuit in a two-to-one opinion by Rosemary Pooler, um, joined by uh, Judge Wesley. Um, the court concludes that all of these things are uh, Bivens claims, that there is no qualified immunity, and that there is indeed a conspiracy that can go forward. There is a dissent by Judge Raji on all of these points. Um, there is an en banc call and the on bank call is denied by an equally split vote of six to six. Um, so you see where this is going, though I will sort of footnote here and you know, reference our uh, old friend Chuck Schumer just to point out that you know, the Second Circuit is a very good court and has many able people, but you can't get on it without Chuck Schumer uh, concluding that you're okay. Um, and even half this court thought this was crazy. Um, <laughs> so, Moving right along, so the case gets to the Supreme Court, um, and in an opinion by Justice Kennedy, the court concludes that there is no uh, Bivens cause of action. Now, Justice Kennedy uh, um, was uh, my justice. I have a lot of affection for him. Um, he has his moments, um, and this is one of them. Um, he is capable of writing closely reasoned technically superior, uh, you know, excellent legal product um, where um, you are actually impressed by the technical accuracy and the flight of fancy and it's everything you could wish in an opinion. Sigler versus Abbasi is one of those opinions, is very closely reasoned, is doctrinal. Um, it is an excellent piece of work and he goes through all of the cases where the court has already gone um, through uh, previous Bivens cases and basically says, look, bottom line of this is we did Bivens when we were engaging in a different 
methodology of constitutional adjudication and statutory adjudication. We have changed how we do both. We now ask for affirmative evidence that Congress wants us to do something, not for evidence that Congress doesn't want us to do something. So therefore, um, we are not going to get rid of all of these cases, but unless you come to us with the exact same context that was at issue in Bivens, Davis versus Passman, and Carlson, um, we will not recognize actions in a new Bivens context. Um, and so he goes through all the claims and concludes um, that these are all new contexts because, of course, is national security, is aliens, is a number of different things that were not quite the mundane things at issue in the earlier cases. Um, and to see just how tough he was willing to be on this and how uh, serious he was about this new context, you know, the tough one on this one was the prison conditions case, right? Because you could make an argument at a somewhat high level of generality that there was not a lot of difference between the Carlson versus Green prison abuse case under the Eighth Amendment and the claims against, you know, the warden that he, these people being beaten and strip searched and completely abused under the Fifth Amendment. Um, but Justice Kennedy says, no, that's a completely different context. The Eighth Amendment versus the Fifth Amendment makes a difference. Um, and I'm going into this level of detail because I think it's gonna be relevant to the next case, which is also interesting. Um, and so now, it seems to me that as it, as it now stands, although Justice Kennedy purported to leave as he as is his wont, some safety hatches here or there, um, we can probably say that all of these Bivens cases, unless you come back with Bivens itself, Passman itself, or Carlson itself, are pretty much dead. Um, and that, on the whole, is probably a good thing. Um, there was, of course, a dissent uh, by Justice Breyer, um, joined by Justice Ginsburg. Um, you may be wondering where everybody else was. The other um, interesting aspect about this case is that this case had a bare quorum. Um, you may know that a quorum of the Supreme Court is six justices. If there were five justices, the court could not hear the case. In this case, Justice Sotomayor was recused. We don't know why, but most likely because she was on the Second Circuit when Iqbal was there. And Justice Kagan was recused. We don't know why, but most likely because she was Solicitor General when Iqbal was there. Um, and so uh, Justice Gorsuch was not yet on the court. Um, so the court her, uh, heard this case with six justices, and it, you know, the ruling was four to, uh, four to two. So we go to our next case, um, which is a tragic case, uh, Hernandez versus Mesa. You may have heard about this, it ended up being a nothing, um, uh, but this case concerned a cross-border shooting by a border patrol agent and uh, who fired a shot across the U.S.-Mexican border and shot a 15-year-old who was on the other side of the border. Now, I am sure that there's some stone-hearted people around you that will say that this is why we need a wall, um, but... <laughs> I'm not one of those people. Um, in any event, depending on who you believe, um, you know, the, the parents of the dead boy claimed that he was playing with his friends. The border agents um, claimed that he was uh, a recidivist um, smuggler of aliens who was running away while they were trying to question um, one of his friends, uh, but in any event, he died tragically. His parents sued. Um, the Fifth Circuit more or less affirmed unanimously in favor of the border agent, but there were like a zillion opinions. Um, and it was sort of interesting. Um, there were claims under the Fourth Amendment for illegal seizure, and there were claims under the Fifth Amendment. Um, now, everybody sort of agreed on the Fifth on the Fourth Amendment, there was a case from the Supreme Court called verdugo Urquides that says that the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply in Mexico. It was actually involving Mexico, so it was hard to get out of that one. Um, <laughs> there was a fight on the Fifth Amendment uh, because there is a case from the 1940s called Johnson, Johnson versus Eisentrager, uh, which involved Nazis trying to get habeas corpus out of a camp in Germany where there was an opinion from the Supreme Court uh, saying in somewhat outraged terms, what are you Nazis talking about? Um, the US Constitution doesn't apply out of the country. It's sort of inconceivable, and that involved you know, the Fifth Amendment. Now the fight um, would have ended there, but for the fact that there is an 
later opinion by, you guessed it, Justice Kennedy, called Boumedien, which held that habeas corpus was available in Guantanamo Bay, and that led the Fifth Circuit to have a fight as to whether Joyce versus Eisenkrager was good enough law. So the compromise was that they agreed that because this was unclear, um, the Border Patrol agent was entitled to qualified immunity and let it go at that. There were a lot of fighting sort of concurring opinions. I think um, there was an interesting concurring opinion by Judge Edith Jones, who dropped a footnote saying, um, and oh, by the way, hello, Bivens. Um, and so the parents of the victim go to the Supreme Court for cert on the constitutional and qualified immunity questions, and the Supreme Court takes the case but adds a Bivens question. So the Supreme Court uh, comes forward and adds you know, the Bivens question, it is, again, one of those highly watched questions. Um, after Ziegler versus Abbasi, the, courts kicks the, uh, you know, the court kicks the um, case back without deciding itself the merits, sort of. Um, it tells the Fifth Circuit to consider the case in light of Ziegler, which you would think in light of the Kennedy opinion means this is not a new context, go away, but somehow feels compelled to write an opinion reversing the Fifth Circuit's application of qualified immunity law because the Fifth Circuit and the court's view had improperly relied on facts that were not within the knowledge of the officer. So in some ways, one of those compromise opinions that issued out of the Supreme Court this year where they were sending it back, obviously, to get a hard foot through a stake through it, you know, a stake put, a stake put through his heart. Um, uh, but somebody felt compelled to say, but you gotta say this about qualified immunity. Final quick case, which is not exactly a Bivens case, but I gotta mention it someplace, um, is an excessive force case, um, and it is, again, one of those Ninth Circuit specials, is count County of Los Angeles versus Mendes. Everybody knows, again, if you didn't go to your law school, um, that excessive um, force claims are governed by an opinion from 1990 called Graham versus Connor. If a cop like beats you, kills you, or engages in some use of force that seems excessive, is governed by the ever helpful totality of the circumstances test. Um, and so, of course, you know, the Ninth Circle always marches to the beat of its own drum. Um, and since the 1990s, it has had something that it calls the provocation uh, rules um, under which uh, a use of force that otherwise might be completely reasonable becomes uh, a basis for liability um, if the cops gave rise to the situation that ended up in the use of force. So the facts here are sheriffs are looking for a fugitive. They go into an empty lot that has a shack at the end. They bust into the shack without a warrant and with, without knocking and without justification. Uh, Mr. Mendes is fast asleep with his girlfriend. He reaches for a BB gun. Um, the officers shoot him and the girlfriend very badly. He ends up having a leg amputated. And so everybody, even in the Ninth Circuit, uh, sort of agrees that this was a violation of the Fourth Amendment uh, and that the use of force was justified because he had a BB gun. Um, but the Fourth, uh, but the Ninth Circuit says, um, under the provocation rule, since you shouldn't have gone in and you gave rise to the situation, uh, please pay. Um, the Supreme Court takes the case uh, and unanimously sets that aside, which you would think is a victory for some common sense. Uh, but there's a lot less here than meets the eye. Um, what the court did was to say that the provocation rule is not an exception to the totality of the circumstances um, rule, but in the only footnote to the opinion, um, the court refused to rule out you know, the possibility that the circumstances giving, right to, giving rise to the so-called provocation could be part of the totality of the circumstances that could lead to liability. And I am here to tell you, Judges Reinhardt and Pregerson have done a lot more with less. And so, <laughs> we'll see how that turns out. Uh, so, uh, First Amendment. Um, you know, the court had a number of interesting uh, cases in the First Amendment. Um, you know, the leading uh, and most interesting case in the First Amendment you probably heard about is a somewhat unlikely trademark case. This is the case that I mentioned earlier from the uh, Federal Circuit, the one case out of seven in which you know, the Federal Circuit was affirmed. And it involves a provision of the Lanham Act that tells the PTO not to register marks, and that I quote, uh, 
disparage persons, living or dead, institutions, beliefs, or national symbols. Now, this has become um, sort of a very uh, a la mode, um, uh, actually you use that in this country for ice cream, don't you? Um, <laughs> a very uh, fashionable um, a provision uh, uh, to use on the left uh, ever since the 1990s where Native American uh, groups starting, uh, started um, asking the PTO to cancel the trademarks uh, for the Washington Redskins uh, on the theory that they were offensive to Native, uh, to Native Americans. Uh, in 2014, um, as the winds of political correctness uh, reached gale and cyclone speeds, uh, uh, the PTO finally uh, succumbed to these entreaties and blandishments and canceled all of six trademarks of the Washington Redskins. Uh, to give you an idea, According to the team, it is worth 2.4 billion, of which it says 214 million, or almost 9% of the value, is actually attributable to the canceled trademarks. So at the same time as this sad story of the poor Washington Redskins was playing itself out on the national stage, um, Simon Tam, uh, who is, he says, a musician, so you can get the DVD and judge by yourself, um, was trying to trademark uh, his so-called music group um, that he wished to call the slants. Um, I was myself not aware of this, but apparently, you know, the slants is a slur for uh, people of Asian descent, and on that ground, the trademark office declined to register the trademark. Uh, it was to no avail that uh, Mr. Tam explained that he wished to reclaim um, the slur and to turn it into something positive and good, much as some uh, African American um, um, groups have done with slurs that I'm not allowed to say because I'm not African American. Um, <laughs> and that in fact can only be said in rap songs. Um, <laughs> but in any event, um, Mr. Tam and his band um, of renown sued, uh, and the Federal Circuit um, uh, held that this provision of the Lanham Act was unconstitutional on its face. So the poor federal government and the Solicitor General had no choice but to go to the Supreme Court because an act of Congress had been invalidated and when that happens you really have to go unless it involves same-sex marriage or something else. Um, <laughs> and so off, off they went to the Supreme Court um, and, but they had a lot of trouble coming up um, with arguments as to why the statute might be constitutional. So the easiest way to the exit, and the first one that the government tried, um, not unreasonable, not unreasonably given the Texas versus Walker case, you know, the license plates case from a couple of terms ago, was to say that the First Amendment didn't apply to this at all because this was government speech. Trademarks were government speech. Um, and in a unanimous opinion on this point by Justice Alito, um, the court had no trouble um, getting rid of this argument. Um, Justice Alito uh, said, well, you know, you know, the government doesn't come up with the trademarks on its own. It just approves what it gets. Uh, if you look at trademarks, the government will approve flatly contradictory trademarks, some in favor of abortion, some pro-abortion. Um, and as he then delicately put it, um, and if this is really government speech, uh, you know, the government is not only babbling, but also saying some, some unseemly things. Here, um, he very coyly cited to an amicus brief cited uh, that, that had been filed by the NFL, um, which really funded by the Redskins, uh, which contained a very instructive appendix. I don't know which um, hardworking associate at Arnold and Porter had to go pull these things out. Um, you know, Justice Alito mercifully did not quote what sort of government speech might be at issue in these trademarks, but hey, you know, here we are. Um, and so some of the trademarks that were government speech included, take your panties off. <laughs> hey, it, it could still be the Bill Clinton administration. Um, <laughs> or perhaps for that era, wet Uranus personal <laughs> lubricant would be more fitting. <laughs> By the way, that's Uranus is in the planet. <laughs> uh, 
Um, there was also capitalism sucks donkey balls, <laughs> which I take it was the slogan of the Obama administration. <laughs> Again, it was Dirty Hooker, which I think was being held in reserve in case Elliot Spitzer makes a comeback. <laughs> um, and there were a number of others. You know, there was uh, Smack My Ass and Call Me Sally, <laughs> which somewhat improbably is for condiments. Um, then again, you know, my all time favorite is The Devil is a Democrat. Um, anyway, they were even better, uh, but you can see why the government speech sort of argument didn't get very far. Um, in any event, um, Justice Alito went on for uh, himself and three others, that is four justices, um, also to turn down the government's argument that this was a subsidy on the part of the government, um, and also to turn down a commercial speech argument because of overbreath. Um, there was a separate opinion for four justices by Justice Kennedy, uh, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, um, who took the view that this was viewpoint discrimination and that therefore that was solely all that was needed to hold this uh, unconstitutional after, after turning down the government's um, uh, argument based on government speech and therefore he, he uh, really did not need to say anything about the subsidy or the commercial speech arguments. And so that is uh, Mattel versus Tam. That may be the only uh, interesting case you're gonna hear today. Um, so our next First Amendment case, Expressions Hair Design versus Schneiderman. So the background on this is that in 1976, Congress made it illegal for businesses to charge more when you pay for a credit card. And so under the federal statute, there were a whole bunch of definitions as they usually are. And the only thing that was really illegal was to add a surcharge when um, you pay with a credit card. So the statute, sadly, expired in 1984. It was not renewed, but as, as often happens in blue states, uh, New York thought this was a handy idea, and they came up with their own statute. As often happens in blue states, they really didn't think about it, and they didn't put any uh, definition, so people don't actually know what the state uh, what the statute actually covers. Um, and so this goes to the Second Circuit, people claiming this is a violation of the First Amendment. And if you're sitting at your chair wondering what the heck does this have to do with the First Amendment, you will not be alone. The Second Circuit concluded that this was a price regulation and that it was all fine. The Supreme Court uh, took the case and concluded that it was a First Amendment issue. Um, and if you're wondering why, let me give you a very abstract hypothetical. You go to a bodega in New York City uh, looking for a banana. The sign at the stand says it's $10. Um, it is New York City. Uh, and so you go to pay, and at the cash register, there is a sign that says 3% discount. If you pay cash, you, of course, are a law firm associate. You never carry a scrap of cash on you. You pay plastic, $10, off you go. Nothing happens. Uh, next week, you go to the bodega next door to your house. The sign says 970 for the banana, and the sign at the cash register said 3% surcharge for the, for the credit card purchase. You still have no cash on you. You pay the same 10 bucks for the credit card, and all of a sudden, Eric Schneiderman has a SWAT team, a bullhorn, and a padlock, and you're going off to jail. And so Chief Justice Roberts thought that the possibility that the statute might work this way meant that there was, uh, that there was a speech issue here somehow. Of course, we don't know how the statute works. Um, and so this is perhaps evidence that the court was looking for something to do this term, and because as three justices pointed out, maybe the thing to do is to send this to the New York Court of Appeals to tell us what the New York law actually is. Um, an actual First Amendment case uh, that the court decided uh, Packingham versus North Carolina. I have, in, I have it here someplace. Maybe I need to find it. Oh, here it is. Um, excuse me. Uh, I used to be organized when I was young. Um, so Packingham versus North Carolina uh, involved a North Carolina statute that made it a felony for a registered sales, uh, uh, sex offender to have access to, quote, a commercial social networking website 
where the sex offender knows that the site permits minor children to become members or to create personal web pages. Okay, so the general idea, you can see the common sense of this, you don't want sex offenders trolling um, the web for small boys and girls. Now the problem um, with this statute is that as it came to the court, everybody pretty much sort of agreed that it applied to the sex offender going on Facebook, Amazon, WebMD, and even the Washington Post on the very strange assumption that anybody reads it. Um, <laughs> and so, um, and so it was pretty clear that, that the statute was actually going down, and the question was sort of how, and you know, uh, the answer was sort of obvious, but hey, you know, uh, the opinion ended up in the hands of Justice Kennedy, and you know what happens when that happens. Um, and so Justice Kennedy begins, uh, tells you how the statute works, and uh, um, he begins his analysis, and I do not use the word advisedly, um, with, with you know, the following sentence. A fundamental principle of the First Amendment is that all persons have access to places where they can speak and listen, and then, after reflection, speak and listen once more. <laughs> so for those of you who were not previously aware, wash, rinse, and repeat is a fundamental principle of the First Amendment. <laughs> So then we have this other gem. The nature of a revolution in thought can be, not is, can be, that in its early stages, even its participants may be unaware of it. And when awareness comes, they still may be unable to know or foresee where its changes lead. Maybe the man should have coffee in the morning. <laughs> um, in any event, um, you know, I just read you some tidbits. You know, the entire opinion, it's sort of a classic of the AMK genre when things go bad. Uh, is a lot of sweeping, grandiloquent platitudes completely unconnected to any relevant legal premise. Um, and if you read it, uh, the one thing that comes to mind, um, or kept coming to my mind anyway, was what Justice Scalia um, called the sweet the sweet mystery of life passage, uh, where you know pure existential grandiosity ate the rule of law. Um, <laughs> and so, so after all of this, you know, Justice Kennedy goes on to tell us that the internet is the modern public square, and that is the only way to have people, you know, have their voices heard and it's a vast potential to alter how we think, express ourselves, and define who we want to be. This is why you think about you know, our concept of liberty, existence, meaning, and the universe, and you know, the mystery of human life. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and so now the internet is the modern public square, um, and on and on and on, and, and, and oh, by the way, the statute is bad because it's too broad, you think. Um, <laughs> So, poor Justice Alito, uh, uh, joined by the Chief Justice and Justice Thomas, wrote a concurrence that I think could barely conceal his despondency at having a life sentence in this asylum. Uh, <laughs> read it. He described Justice Kennedy's opinion as undisciplined dicta and loose rhetoric, which he might want to put that in a macro for future use, um, <laughs> and worried about the implications of all of the comparisons you know, between the internet and the public square. Fair enough. I mean, he would have said that this was clearly overbroad and left everything else for, uh, for the future, which would have been sensible enough. Um, final First Amendment case is not a speech case, is a religion case. This case was actually granted um, um, shortly before Justice Scalia's untimely death, but for some reason, the court did not see fit to uh, set it up for argument until it had a full complement of justices. Perhaps uh, it thought that it was going to be um, a contentious and divided case. Um, and for background to this, just let me take you back to the 19th century, where President Ulysses Grant, um, during a rare sober moment, or perhaps not, uh, proposed a constitutional amendment um, to prohibit public aid to 
parochial schools. Um, this failed uh, in the U.S. Congress, or somewhat narrowly, uh, but it did catch on in the states, and over time, about 38 states ended up adopting what has become uh, known as Blaine Amendments after the Republican congressman who was in charge of putting this through through the U.S. Congress, and basically all of these things, to one extent or another, say that you cannot give public aid to uh, religious schools or other institutions. Now, Missouri has a couple of these things. They're sort of double-barreled in the, double the show-me state, um, and also has a program that happens to reimburse nonprofits if they purchase and install playground surfaces made from recycled rubber tires. So. Holy Trinity has a school for little tykes. The playground has pea gravel. The little tykes get you know, sore knees. It's all very sad. They applied uh, for the resurfaced uh, playground under the, under the program. Um, the state, showing that they need to hire lawyers, um, sent them back a letter saying that Holy Trinity had scored very high, I think like five out of 20 in all of the secular criteria, but that the only reason they were not getting this grant is that you're tied to a church. Um, so let me give you a gift of acknowledging standing and we'll be waiting for your lawsuit, which of course <laughs> you did come. Um, I mean, really, hire some lawyers, people. <laughs> How about, you know, we had many qualified applicants. We regret we could not accommodate you. <laughs> uh, in any event, um, and so Trinity Lutheran um, sued, and it lost in federal district court, and it lost two to uh, one in the Eighth Circuit. And the Supreme Court, in a surprisingly lopsided opinion by the Chief Justice, with only Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg dissenting, concluded um, that the state lost. Uh, the Chief Justice basically concluded that denying a generally available uh, public benefit solely on account of religious identity is a violation of the Free Exercise Clause. Uh, for this proposition, you know, the Chief Justice mostly relied on a um, case by the name of McDaniel versus Patty, a 1978 decision in which the court had held it was unconstitutional for Tennessee to say that ministers could not be members of the Constitutional Convention. Now, this all sounds very, very reasonable, doesn't it? Um, except um, there was this little case called Locke versus Davey in which a lopsided Supreme Court led by a different Supreme Court Chief Justice, uh, Rehnquist, had held um, that the state of Washington, who also had one of these Blaine Amendments, um, did not have to give a grant to Mr. Davey, um, who had also qualified for a student grant to go to college to study based on high grades and poor income um, and non-secular you know, secular criteria because Mr. Davey had announced that he wanted to use his grant to go become a minister. Um, and when the case, you know, oddly enough, the Ninth Circuit had ruled for Mr. Davey saying, well, you, you can't deny Davey access to a generally applicable public benefit just because he wants to use it to go be a minister. Uh, he qualified on non, you know, non-religious grounds. And the Chief Justice 7-2, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Locke versus Davey, overturned the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> Uh, and said, no, 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 you know, to be sure Washington could do that if it wanted to uh, without violating the Establishment Clause, but the states need play in the joints between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, um, and therefore it is not a violation for Washington to tell Davey that although this scholarship is available to everybody else, and would be available to him if he wanted to be, become a lawyer, he cannot get it if he wants to become a minister. Just as Scalia and Thomas dissented in that case, making you know, the argument basically that Chief Justice Roberts made in this case. And so um, the fly in the ointment in this case is of course that the Eighth Circuit and the District Court in the Trinity Lutheran case had thought that Locke, Locke, Locke versus Davey was controlling the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, gave Locke versus Davey basically the back of the hand, saying, "Oh no, I mean, you know, the problem there was that Locke, uh, that Davey was uh, not getting the money because of who he was, but because of what he wanted to do with the money, which is the type of thing that you can say at all argument if the red light is coming on and you're going to escape with your life, but otherwise, <laughs> or if you're, the, you know." 
Supreme Court of the United States, and you can do as Brown versus Allen say, we're not final because we're infallible, we're infallible, you know, we're infallible because we're final. I mean, yes, he can say it. Um, Justice Gorsuch uh, wrote a concurring opinion, but basically sort of saying this is wordplay and it's not really gonna work. We would do better to say that Locke versus Davey is a special rule saying that we'll give a pass to states where they just don't wanna fund the ministry. Um, so that's where the play in the joints currently stands. Now let me sp speed up and talk about some of the class action cases sort of quickly. Um, they're not that interesting except that of course um, some of the wackiest things come from the west of the country. Um, you know, the first one is Microsoft uh, versus Baker. Uh, there was a class action filed against Microsoft on the theory that the Xbox sort of scratched you know, the disks. The district judge sort of sensible concluded, sensibly concluded that this was not a class action because there were individual issues of causation, damages, et cetera. Plaintiffs tried to take a 23F appeal to the Ninth Circuit. N Ninth Circuit said no. Um, and so the plaintiffs said, okay, we'll come back to federal district court and ask for the district court to enter a judgment against us with prejudice. Okay, so the district court did that. The plaintiffs then appealed to the Ninth Circuit, purporting to appeal the class certification denial. The Ninth Circuit, and this only happens in the Ninth Circuit, um, concluded that this was a good way to review the class certification denial, vacated the class certification denial, and concluded that this somehow brought to life the claims of the individual plaintiffs that they had asked be dismissed with prejudice. Um, at the Supreme Court, everybody was in agreement that this was loopy. Um, they, just, they just could not agree on the exact theory. Justice Ginsburg, speaking for a majority of the court, concluded that this was not in fact a final judgment under 1291 because it was an evasion of Rule 23F and an earlier Supreme Court opinion um, called Cooper's Library versus Livesay where you know, the court had overturned something called the death knell doctrine um, that you, know, you don't actually need to go, uh, need to know, and if you went to your law school, you actually don't know. Um, uh, Justices Thomas, uh, the Chief Justice and Justice Alito actually gave what I think is a more cogent answer. There is, of course, a final judgment since the case was dismissed with prejudice, um, but there is no real Article Three controversy because you ask that the case be dismissed with prejudice against you. You have no longer anything to complain about. Um, there was an important uh, securities case raising you know, the question in everybody's mind here as to whether um, the American pipe tolling rule applies to statutes of repose. You know, the short answer is no. Um, there are many detailed answers to that. Um, if you went to Yale Law School, I will just do a sort of a little aside to explain to you that statutes of repose are not the same thing as statutes of limitations. <laughs> statutes of limitations sort of apply from the discovery of what happened to you and give you a time to file a lawsuit. Statutes of repose are for the benefit of the defendant. If you give you know, the bad deed after a certain time, you know, the time has expired and you're considered to be home free and you can sort of go, I'm off. And so that sort of statute is generally not limited to equitable tolling, including American Pipe, that was 5-4. Um, the uh, very important and yet somewhat dull uh, case of Bristol Myers Squibb versus Superior Court of California presented um, the all important question whether the due process clause gives volume discounts to plaintiff's lawyers. Um, um, again, and I'm sorry to sort of pick on Yale Law School, but hey. Um, under the court case law, there is general jurisdiction. You're subject to suit in the state for all purposes, and there is specific jurisdiction. You, you went into the state, punched somebody in the nose, he can sue you over the punch in the nose. And so one is general jurisdiction, right? You live there, and you can be sued there for pretty much everything you do, and the other one is specific jurisdiction, you went into the state, you don't live there, but you punched Ted Olson, he can sue you there for the punch in the nose. Um, and so in this state, um, there was a claim that Bristol Myers, which sort of lives out on the East Coast in, in New York and Jersey, um, had sold a blood thinner um, that caused bad things, and a number of lawsuits were filed in California. Um, and um, so far, so good. And, and some of those people actually lived in California and could claim that there, there was specific jurisdiction because Bristol Myers had sold them you know, the stuff in California. Now, 
Added to that, about 500 other people wanted to join the suit from other states. And the Supreme Court of California thought that there would be specific jurisdiction to have all of the hundreds of suits from everywhere in the country because in for a penny, in for a pound. And it concluded they would apply a sliding scale because taking into account that all of the California people were raising the same claim and that Bristol Myers had other contacts in California, it was sort of fair to sue Bristol Myers on the whole kid and caboodle in California. Um, the Supreme Court, again, by a lopsided vote, said no, Justice Alito um, called this sort of a loose and spurious form of general jurisdiction um, and said, people, if you want to plead general jurisdiction, um, you have to sue in the state where you know the tort actually happened to you. Um, no big surprise there, but it's always good when you know the law actually turns out as you hope it would be, um, which since we're about to turn to criminal cases, and you know the first one is an example of that not happening, um, uh, is sort of a good point to end you know, the class action cases. So criminal law. Um, the first case is actually a very interesting and big case. It's called Peña Rodriguez versus Colorado. How many of you have heard of this very landmark case? No. It's actually, um, so uh, this is uh, a case that well warrants your attention. Um, and as much as I love the man, it's one of those cases that really well showcases Justice Kennedy's unique talent to take whole areas of the law that have withstood the assaults of centuries and turn them into draws. Um, so I'm not kidding. Since, since the 1700s, uh, the common law rule has been that jurors cannot testify about what happened in the jury room. Um, this rule dates from you know, Lord Mansfield, who had cases where jurors came in one case saying, we want to tell you that we actually reach you know, the verdict uh, by averaging you know, the damages, and in the other one, um, we reach you know, the verdict by lot. And he said, no, 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 none of that is admissible. This became you know, the rule in the new country, and now you can find this in Federal Rule of Evidence 606B, where the general rule is what happened in the jury room. It's like Vegas sort of stays in the jury room. Um, and the exception is you can uh, look into external influences. So things that happen or were said in the jury room are completely inadmissible. Um, if the mob kidnapped your sister to sort of get you to vote for an acquittal, that's admissible because that's considered an external influence. So no, so now we're all on this. Um, and you know, you know, jail is a really unpleasant place, right? So this is not the first time that a criminal has thought of like, oh gee whiz, let me go find the juror who'll say something helpful, see if I can upend you know, the verdict, and, and sort of make a claim that this is really bad under the Constitution. Um, and some of these cases uh, are quite compelling. My favorite, you know, Example is Tanner versus the United States, right? Mr. Tanner um, got a very heavy federal rap, um, and after you know he was convicted, there was some very good evidence from a number of the jurors um, that you know the jury uh, uh, room had been what one of them described as one big party, um, and so there were pictures of beer. The jury foreman um, had a liter of wine at lunch every day. Now I know what you're thinking. I've had lunch with Leonard too. Um, <laughs> but um, that was not it, right? I mean, it was, they were smoking pot and snorting coke. Um, it was a regular Bernie Sanders rally, this jury room. <laughs> and so all of this comes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, you know, Justice O'Connor says, like, no, common law rule, Lord Mansfield, hello. Um, and so that's that. Um, and of course, it was a Sixth Amendment claim, and I'm entitled to an impartial jury. And I think it would be hard to argue that if your juror is on a magic carpet high as a kite, then maybe they're not impartial. Uh, but no. Uh, and so Colorado is one of 42 states that has the identical rule 606B. Um, and Mr. Peña Rodriguez is a, is a um, is sort of unclear. I think he's a Mexican alien who is in this country. He may be a legal resident, it's unclear. He was prosecuted for sexual assault in, uh, in, a, in a horse racing uh, track of two little girls. Um, and after the jury convicted, the defense counsel got affidavits from one or two jurors who stated that one of the jurors, H.C., had expressed anti-Hispanic bias. 
Now, among other things, this juror, HC, um, had called the alibi witness an illegal, even though apparently he was a legal resident, and he also stated that in his experience as a former law enforcement officer, quote, Mexican men have bravado that made him think they could do whatever they wanted with women. Nine times out of 10, Mexican men were guilty of being aggressive toward women and young girls, and the, that the defendant did it because his Mexican and Mexican men take whatever they want. Now, I don't know why we would make a federal case out of there, out of that. I think we should put this guy on a bus with Billy Bush and just, <laughs> that would just take care of the problem. Um, anyway, so the Colorado courts took all of this in and say, uh-huh, mm -hmm, rule 606B. Um, and, but the case goes to the Supreme Court in an opinion by Justice Kennedy, 5-3. Justice Kennedy concluded uh, that applying the no impeachment rule in these circumstances was a violation of the Sixth Amendment. Now, you can read the opinion, and the reasons are a little bit fuzzy. So the first part of the opinion um, is a whole an explanation as to what a good idea the no impeachment rule is and its long history. And I'm in, but I don't see how this is helping him. Um, then we take a left turn, different Roman numeral. We talk about the Civil War amendments and how bad racism is. Again, check, check. 14th Amendment good, racism bad. This is not a 14th Amendment claim. Nobody's claiming equal protection. It's a Sixth Amendment claim. I'm not seeing how this is helping. Um, then we get to the key part of the opinion. Uh, what is it that he says? Um, he says, oh yes, new Roman numeral. This case lies at the intersection of the court's decision endorsing the no impeachment rule, part one, and his decision seeking to eliminate racial bias, part two. But these lines need not conflict because we can make an exception. Okay. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, know uh, one of those lesser known uh, Gilbert and Sullivan plays, Iolanthe. Um, there is, you know, um, uh, this scene where uh, uh, everybody's wringing hands going, oh, but, but the law is clear. Every fairy must die who marries a mortal. And the Lord Chancellor comes in and says, oh, the subtlety of the legal mind is equal to the emergency. Let the law read, every Mary must die who does not marry a mortal. And there you are, out of the, out of the problem at once. And this is just Iolanthe, but you know, <laughs> Gilbert and Sullivan was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> now, um, poor Justice Alito, um, you know, the tone of his, <laughs> dissent could perhaps be uh, described as in between incredible, incredulous, or like a long patient sigh. He of course goes like, we've been through this before, and you know, Coke, you know, Coke, Tanner, um, and you know, uh, we've had this rule for a long time, and this has nothing to do exclusively with race, because the juror would be equally as irrational if he didn't like the defendant because he was a domer, um, and he was hell-bent in convicting him because he went to Notre Dame, um, and, but all to no avail. So sticking quickly with Justice Kennedy, because you know he does get a lot of the court's work, um, we had another criminal case, Weaver versus Massachusetts. You know The basic rule here uh, in the background is that if you close the courtroom during Wadir, um, that is, a violation of your right to a public trial and is not subject to harmless error because it's called structural. Um, and uh, that happened in the what dear Mr. Weaver in Massachusetts. Um, his, during a brief period, there were too many jurors. His mother and his pastor could not um, get in to give the fish eye to the prospective jurors. And this was a tragedy. Uh, but Nobody thought of saying boo about it at the time, and so years later he filed an ineffective assistance claim. And so the question is whether uh, you know, the fact that the error is structural matters in the context of the ineffective assistance uh, case. Justice Kennedy writes 16 opinions uh, telling us 
uh, and pondering about what it means for an error to be structural, for trials to be fair, and for life to be good, all to conclude that this was sort of like a short period of time and probably didn't matter anyway. Justice Alito sort of cuts to the chase saying that, um, you know, the public um, courtroom claim was not at issue here. All that's at issue is the ineffective assistance by definition, and Strickland said so. It requires you to show prejudice. Can we go home now? Um, <laughs> There is a, another ineffective assistance of counsel a claim called Leavers of the United States. And the short version of this is that if your lawyer really assures you that you're, you're not going to be deported and he is wrong, that's ineffective assistance. Uh, and if you plead guilty, you don't have to show that you would have been acquitted. Uh, you just have to show that you would not have been pleaded guilty. Um, there was a uh, double jeopardy case for those of you who really, really, really have no private life. Um, it really pits two extremely obscure rules of double jeopardy collateral estoppel law. One of them says that if you have inconsistent verdicts, that is to say the jury convicts you on one count and acquits you on the other, and they're completely inconsistent, it's just crazy that they did this, um, you're stuck because as Oliver Wendell Holmes said in a case in 1920s called Dunn, um, you know, either they were lenient or crazy or irrational and who cares, go. Um, uh, the other one, it's a case called Jaeger, in which you know the court said, um, if the jury convicts you, um, no, if the jury acquits you in one case and hangs on the other, then you are entitled to the collateral estoppel effect uh, from the acquittal on the hung count because the jury did not decide anything inconsistent. And so the issue in Bravo is the all important question of what happens if you have scene uh, number one, you have two inconsistent conviction and acquittal, but on appeal, the Court of Appeals flips the conviction. And uh, do you get you know, the benefit of the other, now you have a vacancy there, can you use collateral estoppel? The Supreme Court said no, um, you still have inconsistent, um, you still have inconsistent verdicts and the other rule controls. We have a number of cases um, having to do with criminal statutes. Um, short, uh, long story short, um, if you sort of try to steal from somebody's bank account and you get prosecuted under the bank fraud, um, it will not help you a lot to say that you were trying to steal from the depositor rather than from the bank. Um, that was 9-0. Um, if you are hoping to claim that the sentencing guidelines are vague because they're just identical to a statute that the court already found vague, that will not help you a lot because the sentencing guidelines are not mandatory, that's Beckles. Um, if you are engaged in insider trading by giving tips to your brother, your brother-in-law, or your wife, um, um, you're in trouble because the court in Salmon versus the United States held that that is still a violation of 10b-5. That actually is a case in which which I probably would say a couple more words because um, this is one of those areas of law in which we actually have no statute and the courts have made it up as they have gone along. Um, there was a huge fight in the East Coast in the Southern District where um, that paragon of restraint, Preet Bharara, who only recently had to be you know, removed um, from his office by prying his fingernails off the door jam, um, had uh, been indicting people by superseding indictments in front of the same judge, the judge that he agreed, that he knew would agree with his view of the law, and avoiding all the other judges, and the Second Circuit got sort of mad with him in a case called Newman and sort of cut back on the insider trading law. The government tried to take that case up to the Supreme Court and failed, um, but in an odd turn of events, one of uh, this judge's colleagues, Jed Rakoff, got somehow invited to sit by designation in the Ninth Circuit, where he promptly got assigned an opinion that disagreed with Newman, that case got, um, uh, got uh, taken up to the Supreme Court and somehow achieving the double feat of getting Jed Rakoff and the Ninth Circuit both affirmed uh, by the Supreme Court in the same case. Um, so we have, oh yes, just a couple of minutes for the important property rights case of the term Murr versus Wisconsin. Um, it is sort of an abstruse case because it involves the area of regulatory takings. Um, this was sort of a case mostly about methodology. Usually you start by defining what the property interest is. Um, this is your house, uh, you know, the, 
government is trying to do X, Y, or C to it? Have they done too much to it? Have they taken too much of the useful value? The issue here is how do you define you know, the area of property? What happened here was that the MERS had two properties that, have, uh, that had come to them as inheritance from their parents. The law in Wisconsin, because this was a scenic area, was that if you had two lakefront properties, you could not sell them separately. You had to develop them as one lot because they didn't want to have overly develop lakefront property, and the question was whether that was a regulatory taking. Um, this was a very complicated fight, but the essence of the fight at the end of the day was whether um, the state could engage in what amounted to double counting, but engage by redefining the property interest on the front end by saying, we deem this to be a single property uh, lot already encumbered by this restriction, and then doing the usual regulatory analysis on the back end. And that's what Justice Kennedy said was the right answer over a, a dissent by the Chief Justice basically saying that that's, this basically would mean that states would circumvent all of the restrictions on regulatory takings. Um, I should probably say a couple of words about um, cases that are coming up next term, and in particular, you know, the one that the court took uh, you know, the last day of the term, the so-called travel ban case. There are a couple of other boring cases having to do with cases under the discrimination laws and whatnot that I'm sure you probably would rather not hear about. Um, and so, uh, so the Travel Act case, there are actually two cases in the next term um, that are very interesting under the immigration laws. Let me take, the, the one that the court had this term and was set for re-argument next term. There are several immigration statutes that say that if you are an excludable alien or other classes of aliens, you're subject to mandatory detention. So for example, to give you an easy example, if you are somebody who comes up to an airport, LAX, and claims asylum, the person who is at the airport may conclude that your story is not facially incredible and claim that maybe you should be allowed to be examined uh, some more and be temporarily sort of uh, let in just for the purposes of examining these things, but you're subject to mandatory detention. You're not allowed to roam the streets. Um, and so there was a class action saying that in these cases, um, the government had to give people like this bail after six months. And the Ninth Circuit held that these things um, had to happen. In this case, Jennings versus Rodriguez went to the Supreme Court, was argued in November. Now, the statute, you could argue, is pretty clear that bail is just not available. But the argument is that it would be unconstitutional for bail to be denied because it is an invasion of a liberty interest. Um, and so after hearing argument on this question in November, the Supreme Court early in the year asked for briefing on the constitutional question, and then on the last day of the term set the case for re-argument. Now, um, very interesting case, and it depends on how you look at what the liberty interest is. Just to give you a little bit of background on that one, there is an earlier famous case from 1953, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, it's called Shaughnessy versus Mizai. Mizai was a stateless Hungarian who had lived in this country for 25 years in Buffalo, he um, left to go to Hungary uh, to visit his dying mother and came back to Ellis Island where he was excluded as an excludable alien. I think he was a communist. Surprise. Um, and so um, uh, he sort of filed for habeas corpus and all of that and the Second Circuit sort of agreed with him over a dissent by learned hand. Um, the government went to the Supreme Court where the government won. And the learned hand point was sort of simple and sort of helps you sort of understand what's at the center of the fight as to whether this is a liberty interest. Learned hand was, what liberty interest? We're only keeping him if he wants to be here and wants us to examine his application. He's free to get on the next boat that pulls on our shore and go away. Um, and so, and the answer was, well, he's stateless. No country will take it to which Learned Hand's somewhat heartless answer was he can, he's free to sail the seas like the Flying Dutchman until his final <laughs> days come. <laughs> and that was basically the view that gained, you know, favor from the Supreme Court in 1953. Um, that was b before they had, this is just a statement of fact, by the way, that was before the court had female members. Um, 
in any event. Um, so that's the underlying issues in the Jennings case, but it, it, it really has to do with the capacity of the country as a country to exclude aliens who come to our, um, to our uh, shores and to keep them uh, incarcerated until we're really, really sure that they don't pose a, 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 any sort of a danger. Um, now the next one is, of course, you know, the so-called ban. And that one, uh, you all know the story on, on the last day of the term, um, the uh, court dealt with the government's applications to stay the injunctions that have been entered by the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit. Um, and what is clearly a compromise, uh, you know, the court basically lifted most of the injunctions and allowed the injunctions just to proceed for those who had bona fide close familial relationships and bona fide commercial you know, relationships and those that are, and I think the court made quite clear that those were pre-existing and went out of its way to say that if you're an immigrant rights organization, it is not a bona fide you know, relationship to invite somebody to come. Um, now, it seems pretty clear um, that although the court set this case for all argument in October, um, the court also made clear that it expects the government to conduct whatever study it, is, it says is conducting about this over the summer. And to drive the point home, also asked the, the government to brief the question of mootness um, as to whether this case will still be live then. Um, and so uh, the short version of the travel ban is that the chief justice engineered a compromise to give the government most of this ban for the 90 days the government claimed it needed. Um, and it sent it over to the White House with a note to say, saying we're going away for the summer. We expect not to find this back when we come back. And I think that's all we have. A lot of time. Oh. Oh, boobs. You know, there, there, there are two thoughts I have here. One is uh, uh, that I won't. I, I told Miguel at the start that this was a test, given the nature of the term. If he uh, uh, could, he, could, he, could he make this interesting and keep the attention of the audience? I think you passed. <laughs> well, thank you. And since uh, uh, this is consumable, and our standard tie repeated enough times isn't exactly, we thought this would be a more appropriate gift. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so Wonderful much.